I, um, I've never been on campus here before, and I'm really glad to be here. I um, was telling someone, I, first time I was ever down, the, I was in the valley. My parents and I were here, and I hate to admit this because it shows why my hair is so gray, in 1954. And we were out on South Padre, and I have pictures of my parents, well, I inherited them, uh, frolicking in the surf at about the year of 14 or something, I don't really know. And there was a, a, a ship that had wrecked or something uh, along the, right where all of the hotels are, I think. Now, I've been back since then, obviously, but I'm always glad to come down here and I um, uh, enjoy it. And I was in Illinois yesterday, day before yesterday, and it was just so bitterly cold that this is a welcome relief. <laughs> I, um, I'm going to talk today about the Battle of Tippecanoe, and I'm going to talk about the War of 1812. I'm going to talk about a man who is probably the most remarkable Native American leader in American history. And I may be prejudiced, but I think most historians would, would argue that Tecumseh is a, a remarkable man, and we have, uh, uh, he's been lionized quite a bit by uh, historians and in pop culture, and he's one of the few Native American leaders who, uh, even shortly, even during his lifetime, those those Anglo-Americans who opposed him spoke very highly of. Um, goodness sakes, there's all kinds of things been named for Tecumseh, Tecumseh this, Tecumseh that. Uh, one of them is a lawnmower. Uh, so, so that maybe wouldn't make him so happy, but um, still to make a long story short, it's an interesting, interesting man. And I'm going to talk about his brother, who in some ways is even more interesting in that um, let me I'll preface this and, and then try to read through it. But as one of my friends said, everybody ought to have one good idea in their life, and that was probably mine. I had been riding on a group of, um, uh, on a group of Indians, a tribe of people up in, in the Great Lakes area called the Potawatomies. And it was my PhD dissertation, and, and when it was finished, I finished the, the history of them in about 1795. There's a thing called the Treaty of Greenville. And then I, was to con I wanted to continue that through removal, which would be about the 1840s. And so I had a job at the University of Wyoming. I have a PhD out of Oklahoma. My first job was Wyoming. Uh, I thought I had seen wind in Oklahoma. Nope, not until you've got to Wyoming have you seen wind. But that's another whole story. And um, I remember sitting there um, thinking, oh, I'm really going to find an awful lot about Tecumseh, an awful lot about Tecumseh, an awful lot about Tecumseh. And as I started go going back to the records, et cetera, he wasn't even mentioned. All of the letters, all the contemporary reports were on this man called the prophet. Now, prior to that time, Tecumseh was seen sort of as, uh, or, or the prophet was seen as, he, he's a brother to Tecumseh, but he was kind of like, uh, you know, most of you are going to be too young to appreciate this, but Roy Rogers and Gabby Hayes, in other words, there was a, uh, he was a sidekick, so to speak. And, but I, I couldn't figure, well, if that's the case, why is everyone writing about him at the, back then and we've ignored him now? And I was, I guess, lucky or unlucky enough to be alive at the time that the Ayatollah Khomeini was coming to power in Iran. And I can remember, I can remember sitting in my, um, my mobile home in Laramie, Wyoming, and just one of those little cartoon characters, once in a while you'll see the little light bulb goes on and the light bulb went on. And I, what's happened was that the prophet, the religious leader, made categorically no sense to non-Indians. What he was doing was just completely alien to their reasoning. But what he was doing made a lot of sense to Native American people. And the light bulb went on, and so I began to look at this, and I thought, well, this is kind of like the Ayatollah. When he, when he came to power, all of us looked at him, and, well, how can those Iranians be following this man? But he obviously, in that fundamentalist revolution, has made a lot of sense to some Iranians since then. And um, anyway, that's the, one of the reasons I got into this, this, uh, this subject. But let, with, without further ado, let me read the paper, because uh, otherwise I'll, I'll go on and on and on. November. November is a very dark and dreary month in western Indiana. The bright fall foliage that blankets the Wabash Valley has faded and fallen, and the sunshine of October usually has given way to cloudy skies, falling temperatures, and intermittent rain. Any of you who've ever lived in the Midwest in November through the winter understand this. 
On the evening of November the 6th, 1811, about 1,000 American soldiers, militiamen and volunteers bivouacked in a loosely fortified, muddy camp along Burnett's Creek, about a mile from the juncture of the Tippecanoe and Wabash River, and approximately two miles from Prophetstown, the center of, for Native American resistance in the Old Northwest. And they were aware that Prophetstown held a host of warriors hostile to the United States. General William Henry Harrison, the, government of, the governor of Indiana and commander of the American expedition, placed a scattered picket line about 50 miles, 50 miles, 50 yards, beyond the outer perimeter of his camp and ordered his men to sleep near their posts, their weapons primed and ready. Now the night passed amidst fog and light showers, but at 4.15 in the morning, before any sign of sunrise broke the shrouding darkness, one of the centuries beyond the northwestern perimeter of the camp caught a glimpse of movement in the woods, fired his musket, then fled back toward the American lines. Frightened by the gunshot, another sentry also fired blindly into the forest, and to the Americans' alarm, the surrounding forest erupted in war cries and musket fire. The ensuing Battle of Tippecanoe, which would alter the nature of Native American resistance in the War of 1812 and propel a frontier general to a very short-lived presidency, had started. It was not a battle that Tecumseh, the primary political and military leader of the Indian resistance movement, wanted. Indeed, Tecumseh was not even present. He was visiting tribes in the South in an ill-fated attempt to persuade warriors from the Chickasaws and the Choctaws and the Creeks to join his resistance movement. He had hoped to at least delay any armed confrontation with the Americans until his return to Indiana, and he had left his brother, Tenskwatawa, the Shawnee prophet, in charge of Prophetstown. But while Tecumseh was in the South, Harrison had forced, had forced the Indians' hand. Now, historians have long been critical of Tenskwatawa's decision to attack Harrison's camp, but in retrospect, he had very little choice. The American expedition threatened the storehouse of food, ammunition, and other supplies stockpiled by the Shawnee, in the Shawnee Brothers' village, and Tenskwatawa had been forced to defend them. There were too many supplies to be moved, and the prophet was determined not to surrender. Ironically, the prophet had been more instrumental than Tecumseh in bringing those warriors who opposed Harrison to Prophetstown in the first place. Although Tecumseh recently had assumed the political and military leadership of the village, Prophetstown initially had been established as a religious place, a, a religious center, a place where tribespeople from throughout the Midwest could assemble to listen to the prophet's teaching. Indeed, Quote, Prophetstown, the settlement's very name, reflected the dominant position of the Shawnee, Shawnee Holy Man in 1808 when the village had been founded. And Tecumseh's efforts to forge a political and military movement among his brother's disciples had played only a secondary role until 1809 when Indian resentment over the loss of tribal lands signed away by pro-American village chiefs at the Treaty of Fort Wayne caused many younger warriors to abandon these older, more compliant leaders and rally to Tecumseh. Yet even then, the prophet's promises of divine intervention continued to draw warriors to Prophetstown and added a reassuring patina of spiritual blessing to Tecumseh's more worldly attempts to limit American expansion. Now the prophet's Early prominence is not surprising. During periods of, of dire social, political, and economic duress, Native American people have traditionally sought a religious deliverance. Evidence indicates that, that militant religious leaders have emerged at King Philip's War, certainly before, with Pope's Rebellion in New Mexico, and we could go on and on and on and through the uh, ghost dance on the 1890s. 
Tenskwatawa, the Shawnee prophet, Tecumseh's younger brother, fits admirably into this pattern. In the two decades that followed the end of the American Revolution, between 1783 and about 1803, the tribes in Indiana and Illinois and uh, Wisconsin and Ohio particularly had seen their lands overrun by settlers, their forests depleted of game and fur-bearing animals, and their villages flooded with alcohol. Indian Asians had neither the will nor the resources to protect the tribe's people, while other officials acting on behalf of the federal government compounded their problems by purchasing piecemeal, bit by bit, much of the Indian, remaining Indian land base. Amidst this chaos, and all of this is going on, in the spring of 1805, a ne'er-do-well Shawnee alcoholic, a man who just was despised by many people in his village, experienced a life-changing trance in which he appeared to die. Sitting in front of his, of his fire in his lodge and he reached over to pick up a, uh, a brand out of the fire, a stick to, write, to light his pipe, and as he did it, he fell over. And he seemed to be dead. And in fact, he laid there so quietly, his wife went to, to get some people from a neighboring lodge and they couldn't revive him. And so they assumed that he was dead and they began to make the uh, plans for the four-day Shawnee mourning period. And while they did that, all of a sudden he, quote, came back. Claiming that he had died, gone to heaven, and then returned to earth, the Shawnee, formerly known as Lalawetheka, which translates, translates strictly as the noisemaker, but idiomatically translates probably as, as loudmouth. That's what they called him because he was sort of a braggart. Announced that while he was in paradise... He had been instructed by divine beings in a new way of life for the Shawnees and for other Indian people. Henceforth, according to this former alcoholic, he would be called Tenskwatawa, the open door, a name indicative of his new role among his people. Now, frontier whites and many Indians would refer to him as then the Shawnee prophet, and he propounded a new syncretic faith that combined traditional Shawnee beliefs with concepts and practices taken from Christianity. According to the prophet, the tribe's people's troubles emanated from their abandonment of their formal traditional ways and their acceptance of new cultural patterns borrowed from the Americans. They had adopted too much of the American lifestyle. Tenskwatawa reminded his followers that the great serpent, the Shawnee counterpart of Satan, for the Shawnees, the devil per se is not a little man with horns and wears a red outfit or whatever. It's a great serpent that lives in the water. That's what the, the symbol of all evil is. And it lived in the great water. And since the Americans had arrived on the eastern shore of North America from out of the Atlantic, that they then were also the children of the serpent. He admonished his followers to cease all contact with the Americans and to abandon almost all aspects of Euro-American culture. They should no longer eat white men's food, dress in white men's clothing, nor hunt with white men's weapons, although they could use firearms to protect themselves. Moreover, they should be particularly wary of those Native Americans who already had adopted European cultural patterns particularly Christianity, since such adherence to American ways indicated that these individuals were witches. They had sold out to the serpent. If tribal people did not return to their old ways, then the chaotic times would, uh, which they recently had experienced would continue, and after their death they would be condemned to a fiery hell, which resembles very much the Christian idea of hell, where they would be tortured. But on the other hand, if they abandoned the white man's ways, the game would return to the forests. Their fields would produce abundant crops of corn and pumpkins, pumpkins as big as houses, for example. And peace and plenty would again prevail throughout the Shawnee's universe. Now, missionaries and Indian agents who were doing their very best to convert these people, to, be, to, to, to convince them to adopt white ways, did not want to hear this, obviously. And they condemned the prophet uh, continually. 
In the spring of 186, then, the prophet journeyed to some Delaware rivers on the White River in, in eastern Indiana and denounced several acculturated Delawares. They've been converted by the Moravian missionaries, denounced them as witches. In response, the Delawares burned four of their own tribes people as witches. Now that upset the Moravians, obviously, since their congregation was going up in smoke. And they complained to William Henry Harrison, who in turn wrote to the Delawares, admonishing them for their recent executions and denouncing Tenskwatawa, this prophet, as a, quote, pretended prophet, an imposter. Why, he asked, would the great spirit select such a charlatan to deliver his message? According to Harrison, if the prophet was truly blessed, the Delaware should demand that he perform a miracle. He should raise the dead, cause the rivers to flow backward, alter the rising of the moon, or as Harrison put it, quote, if he really is a prophet, ask of him to cause the sun to stand still. In retrospect, Harrison could not have done anything that could have played into the prophet's hands so completely. On June 16, 1606, a complete eclipse of the sun darkened the skies across the Midwest from Illinois to Ohio, and the prophet successfully predicted it. Now, historians have speculated for decades on how he did it, and we do know that the eclipse had been predicted by astronomers on the East Coast, some of whom had journeyed to the Midwest to observe it. But there's no record that Tenskwatawa had any contact with them. The Shawnees up at Little Axe in Oklahoma still say, well, of course he did it. He did it through his own medicine. He knew. But whatever the source, the source of his clairvoyance, the immediate effect of, of his successful prediction was, was stunning. Although the Shawnee, among the Shawnees, an eclipse is a mokhdushwa kisa, a black sun, an omen that's, that supposedly warns of future bloodshed. The prophet not only predicted it, but he also claimed to have brought the sun back from the darkness. And following this event, tribes people flocked to Tecumseh's village in western Ohio, in which the prophet was living, in such numbers that the Shawnees could not feed them. They're coming in from as far west, north and west as Minnesota, Lake Superior. People are coming in to see them. It upsets all the Indian agents. All right. Meanwhile, Indian agents and other officials in Ohio became so alarmed over the influx of, quote, foreign Indians that they feared armed conflicts might arise between the newcomers who foraged through the countryside looking for food and among them and the growing numbers of settlers in the region. Now, in late 1807, the Shawnee village near modern Greenville in western Ohio had been visited by a plethora of tribes from throughout the, the, the uh, Midwest. From as far west as Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, I'm not going to go through all of them, but included in these visitors were Potawatomis, a very populous people residing in villages which stretched from southern Wisconsin around the southern tip of Lake Michigan and across northern Indiana and southern Michigan as far east as Detroit. It was Mainpock, one of these Potawatomi visitors, who would have a significant impact on both the rise and the fall of Prophetstown. Mainpock was a Wabano, a powerful medicine man among the, the Potawatomis, the Ottawas, the Chippewas, all have this tradition of Wabinos. And he was a man whose village was located on Rock Creek near its juncture with the Kankakee River in northeastern Illinois, would be about 40 miles south of modern Chicago. Of mixed Potawatomi stock lineage, Mainpock had been born in about 1760 without any thumb or fingers on his left hand. Thence his, hence his name, Mainpock, or crippled hand. Yet this Potawatomi claimed that the birth defect was a special sign from the master of life, that he had been specially blessed with other talents. And by the first decade of the 19th century, by 1800, he had emerged as perhaps the most influential Indian in Illinois. Wabanos 
were the most powerful of the Potawatomi medicine men, and Mainpak was reputed to be both a fire handler, someone who could handle fire without being beat, someone who could ride lightning, for example, and also a, uh, a shift shape, or a person who could transport themselves into, into the shape of an animal. Like Tenskwatawa, before his transformation, Mainpak also was much addicted to alcohol. But unlike the Shawnee holy man, the Potawatomi had no intention of renouncing frontier whiskey, claiming that the master of life had told him that he needed the fire water to preserve and enhance his medicine. When he was in his cups, Mainpak was a belligerent, mean-spirited brawler, but he also was a successful war chief whose campaigns against the Osages in Missouri and the occasional race to steal horses from white settlements near St. Louis had brought him an envied prominence among the tribes in Illinois. This was a very influential man among Indian people in Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana. In October of 1870, Maine Pock and a small party of his followers journeyed to the Shawnee village near Greenville, where he remained until December, meeting with Tenskwatawa and, eventual, and evidently exchanging ideas about religion, etc. Yet he also spent considerable time talking with Tecumseh about the logistical problems of feeding all the tribespeople who continued to flock to the prophet's camp. Obviously, the Shawnee village near Greenville had depleted most of the game from the surrounding forest, and its cornfields could not provide adequate harvests to feed the throng of visitors who crowded its wigwams. Moreover, its location in western Ohio made it particularly vulnerable to American political influence or military intervention. After some discussion, Mainpock suggested that the Shawnee brothers relocate their village to the juncture of the Tippecanoe and Wabash River in western Indiana. The region still held abundant game, and the Tippecanoe and Wabash rivers teemed with fish. In addition, the location was closer to many of the Illinois and Wisconsin tribes who were eager for the prophet's teachings, while it was further removed from the Americans. The Potawatomi shared the region with the Miamis and Kickapoos, but Maine Pock believed that they would either agree or if they disliked it, too bad. Following Maine Pock's invitation, then in the spring of 1880, the Shawnee brothers, Tecumseh and, and Tanskwatawa, or the prophet, moved to the Tippecanoe and erected this new village, Prophetstown. Within a year, the settlement had grown to include about a thousand followers and featured rows of wigwams, a large council house, a medicine lodge for the prophet, and something called the House of the Stranger, which was a very large structure where visiting tribes people who came to meet with the prophet could stay while they were there. But logistical problems that had plagued Tecumseh and the prophet at Greenville continued. They had arrived in Indiana late in the planting season, and during the summer of 188, they had little corn. Game and fish were more abundant than in Ohio, but still insufficient to feed the permanent residents and the visitors who continued to come to their village. So during the summer of 188, Tecumseh, Tecumseh journeyed to Canada to seek assistance from the British, and the prophet descended the Wabash River to Vincennes, where he cajoled William Henry Harrison. He met with William Henry Harrison into believing that he only was interested in denouncing alcohol and championing an ongoing friendship with the Americans. Initially hoodwinked, Harrison reported to his superiors that the prophet has, he's probably been misconstrued. We've misunderstood him. And that the, uh, the holy man is now under his control, under Harrison's control, and he was going to make him a useful instrument uh, in effecting a radical change among the Indians. He then gave Tenskwatawa, the prophet, a supply of corn and a bunch of agricultural implements and sent them back up the Wabash. Now, the corn supplied by Harrison temporarily fed the Indians at Prophetstown, but by autumn it was gone. Although the new fields near the Tippecanoe were fertile, they were, had not been well tended, 
and in the fall of 188 they failed to produce substantial harvests. Meanwhile, the population continued to grow, further straining the prophet's resources. And to add to the Indians' problems, the winter of 1808-1809 excuse me, was particularly severe. Snow that fell three feet in November blanketed the ground until April. And weakened by their depleted diet, the residents of Prophetstown fell victim to another of the white man's nameless diseases and which seemed selective in its infection. It passed over most Shawnees, Kickapoos, and Potawatomis, but fell heavily on Ottawa's and Chippewa's who had arrived from Michigan, killing or carrying off about 160 of these northern tribesmen while killing only five Shawnees. Angered, in the spring, many of the Ottawas and the Chippewas abandoned the prophet, left Prophetstown, and returned to their home village, charging that perhaps the prophet's new, new religion was, more, was only for more southern tribes people. Other Chippewas who had lost kinsmen there threatened to kill him, but Indian agents intervened, saying, oh my gosh, don't do that. We don't want a full-scale Indian war breaking out because we think it would spill over on the settlements. Now, in addition, informants also reported to Harrison that the prophet actually was much less friendly to the United States than he earlier had seemed. And in June 189, when the prophet again visited Harrison, he found that the government accorded him a cool reception. When asked about Indian hostility toward the government, Tenskwetabra said, well, yes, it did exist. There was hostility towards the government, but he was doing his very best to once again diffuse it. That's what Prophetstown had become, a center where Indians came and learned about how good things were with the United States. But Harrison didn't buy into this, and when the prophet left, he then wrote to his superiors in Washington that he'd changed his mind, and they now believe the prophet to be, quote, a great scoundrel. But Harrison also believed, because of the illnesses, that the prophet's power was waning. He wasn't as powerful as he was. And he was aware of the Indians' crop failures, that the disease had plagued Prophetstown, that many Ottawas and Chippewas were disaffected, and convinced that the Shawnee holy man and his followers could do little to stop a land station, in September 189, Harrison met with pro-government chiefs. These are older village chiefs that are more compliant. Among the Miamis, Delawares, and some Potawatomis at Fort Wayne and purchased three million acres of northern Indiana and extreme eastern Illinois. The Treaty of Fort Wayne was a temporary victory for Harrison since it gave the United States a new claim to lands in the region, but it backfired since it accelerated the rise of Tecumseh and pushed many of the younger warriors throughout the region into the Shawnee Brothers' camp. Now, in 1808 and 1809, while Tecumseh had been meeting with Harrison in Vincennes, Tecumseh, the older brother, journeyed to tribal villages across the Old Northwest, warning younger warriors that many of their older traditional chiefs could not be trusted. According to Tecumseh, these government chiefs had been corrupted by the federal government, by bribes. They were willing to sell tribal lands piecemeal for annuity payments or for trade goods. Moreover, Tecumseh argued that the remaining Indian land base in the Old Northwest and elsewhere did not belong to individual tribes, but to all Indian people. It was not tribal land. It was Indian land. And individual tribes or leaders had no right to sell any of it. Now, obviously, such a perspective threatened federal land acquisition policies, which were based upon the purchase of specific portions of land from selected and complacent tribal leaders. Tecumseh also argued that the master of life here's, had appointed him, his brother, and he to assume a centralized position of leadership and that no more land should be sold. Now, such concepts of centralized leadership, a Indian leader for all of the tribes, was alien to most Indian people at that time, since political loyalties were to tribe or to kin, not to some centralized political entity. 
And many Indians, particularly the tribal chiefs, the village chiefs, disliked this very much. Yet the Treaty of Fort Wayne caused many of these disbelievers, the younger men, to reassess their loyalties. Once again, aging chiefs had proven vulnerable to government promises. Three million acres of Indian land now supposedly belonged to the Americans. And angry young Miamis, Potawatomis, Delawares now turned from their older traditional chiefs to the Shawnee brothers. Both Tecumseh and the prophet welcomed him. Following the river, the treaty, pardon me, they, they had renewed their efforts among many of the tribes, and throughout the Middle West, tribes again came to the villages, to the prophet's town. Meanwhile, for the first time, large quantities of British food and ammunition arrived in the village. Now, alarmed by the prophet's apparent resurgence, Tecumseh then sent several spies up the Wabash, but Tenskwatawa threatened them and drove them from his village. So in response, Harrison at Vincennes sent a message to Tenskwatawa, the prophet, inviting him to come again to Vincennes, meet with the governor, and perhaps even go to Washington, where he could meet with the great father, the president. And what he hoped, of course, was that the prophet would be sort of overawed by being in Washington. Well, the problem was that Harrison didn't get the prophet. What he got was Tecumseh. In August 1810, the Shawnee war chief, accompanied by about 75 warriors, descended the Wabash, arriving in Vincennes on August the 12th. Harrison and Tecumseh met for 10 days, and although at first the two men quarreled and almost came to blows, cooler heads prevailed, and they eventually developed a grudging respect for each other. Speaking for both himself and the prophet, Tecumseh refused any invitation to visit Washington and warned Harrison that settlers should not occupy those lands that Harrison thought he had purchased. All right. In reply, Harrison reiterated the government's position that the land now belongs to the United States. But during the negotiations, Tecumseh also asserted that in the future, Harrison should no longer meet with village chiefs. For according to Tecumseh, he alone was, in his own words, the acknowledged chief of all the Indians. On August 21st, Tecumseh and his followers left for Prophetstown, and in the aftermath, Harrison reported to Washington that although he still regarded the prophet as a powerful adversary, he now envisioned Tecumseh, the brother, as, quote, really the efficient man, the Moses of the family, a bold, active, sensible man, daring in the extreme, capable of any undertaking. Now, following the conference in, Vince, in Vincennes, Indian agents tried to meet with friendly chiefs in, at Fort Wayne, but it was obvious that by this time, the United States and Britain were headed towards war. Both sides hoped that if war broke out, they could at least either have the, the alliance of the Indians, the British hoped that, or the United States hoped to keep them, hoped to keep them neutral. And Tecumseh again went to Detroit seeking British aid. The British promised they would send it, and Tecumseh, but asked Tecumseh not to precipitate anything. In response, Tecumseh told the British, please send the aid. We are not ready for anything. I'm going to go into the South to try to recruit Indians from the southern tribes. Now, Tecumseh returned to Prophetstown early in 1810. During the winter of 1810 and 11, he sent out additional emissaries to tribes across the southwest, but they also used their arms that had come in to arm warriors who came to their village. Indeed, by the spring of 1811, Tecumseh and the prophet had accumulated a surplus of food and ammunition at Prophetstown, which they stored in separate log or bark buildings. Meanwhile, Tecumseh made plans about making, to make a major recruiting trip through the south, hoping to enlist the Chickasaws, Choctaws, and Creeks. When Harrison inquired about rumors that the Shawnees were massing warriors on the Tippecanoe, Her Tecumseh sent word that the Americans shouldn't be alarmed that he would journey to Vincennes and explain everything. So accompanied by about 100 warriors, Tecumseh arrived in Vincennes, July 27, 1811.
Harrison and the Shawnee war chief met intermittently for five days. Tecumseh assured Harrison that, quote, the white people were unnecessarily alarmed and that he and Tenskwatoma meant nothing but peace. He acknowledged that he was en route to the, to the South to enlarge his confederacy, but he compared his action to that of the United States, which had combined several states into a single union. He promised that when he returned, he would go and see the president in Washington and settle everything with him. And on August the 4th, the conference ended. Tecumseh and 20 warriors continued to the South, and the rest of the Indians went back to Prophetstown. Now, undoubtedly, Tecumseh wanted Harrison to remain in Vincennes while he was gone until he returned. But the straw that broke the camel's back was Mainpock, the old man in Illinois. Although both Tecumseh and the prophet had urged their followers not to precipitate any conflict with the Americans, they couldn't control the old Potawatomi Wabino. Indian depredations in Indiana had dwindled in the summer of 1811, but such was not the case in Illinois, where Mainpock and his followers, furnished with ample supplies of new British arms and ammunition, unleashed a series of attacks upon American settlements in southern Illinois and eastern Missouri. Taking a serious toll on both lives and property, they repeatedly struck the road between Vincennes and St. Louis, making travel hazardous, then played havoc on, in, on isolated settlements, stealing horses that they drove north to Potawatomi and Kickapoo villages along the Illinois River or on the Grand Prairie of Illinois. Settlers fled back to Kentucky, and an irate Governor Ninian Edwards of Illinois pleaded for, head, for Harrison to do something. With the Cumps in the South, then, Harrison was eager to move against Prophetstown, and Maine Pock's ill-advised forays into southern Illinois were a godsend. The recent attacks had not emanated from Prophetstown, but they provided a ready excuse to attack the village. Harrison knew that there were large stores of British supplies at Prophetstown, and he believed if he could destroy the village, quote, before Tecumseh's return, the Indian movement will be demolished and even its foundations rooted up. Accordingly, during September 1811, the, government, the governor assembled 1,000 troops, including regulars, Indiana militia, Kentucky volunteers at Vincennes, and on September 26, he led them north towards Prophetstown. In mid-October, he stopped to uh, construct a stockade near modern Terre Haute, Indiana, which he modestly named Fort Harrison. And by the afternoon of November 6, he had advanced to within one mile of Prophetstown. And the prophet knew he was coming. This wasn't a surprise. Scouts had monitored the progress of the American expedition as it came up the Wabash, and Tenskwatawa had sent riders to Potawatomi and Kickapoo villages in Illinois asking for additional warriors. Some of his followers at Prophetstown, particularly a large contingent of Winnebagos from Wisconsin, had urged him to attack the Americans before they got there. But the, pro but the prophet hesitated. He was a holy man, not a warrior, and he hoped the master of life would intervene and send the long knives back down the Wabash. But the great serpent goaded his children on, and on the afternoon of November the 6th, they were only a mile from Prophetstown. In desperation, Tenskwatawa sent a small party of warriors toward them with a flag of truce, informing Harrison that he previously sent other parties down the Wabash to meet with the expeditions. Hadn't Harrison met them? No? Hmm. They must have gone down the wrong side of the river. And that he wished to meet with the Americans on the following morning just to settle all the differences peacefully. Now, to his officer's dismay, Harrison agreed. He had little hope for any negotiated settlement since he planned to demand that the Indians surrender all their accumulated arms and ammunition, and he believed they would refuse. If such proved to be the case, Harrison then planned a surprise attack of his own on the Indian village during the following evening. In the general's own words, as he wrote in his diary, he would treat the tribesmen to, quote, bayonets and buckshot, 
then burn Prophet's town. But first he would at least meet with the prophet and present his demands. And following the brief meeting with the prophet's envoys, the Americans withdrew to the campsite overlooking Burnett's Creek and established the fortified camp as night fell. In Prophet's Town, all was confusion. The Winnebagos, the Kickapoos, and some of the more militant tribesmen wanted to immediately attack the Americans. Others waited, hoping that Tenskwatawa, the open door, would provide them with an answer. For his part, the prophet retreated into his lodge, consulted at length with the master of life, then reappeared and promised his followers another miracle. The master of life, he said, had provided him with special medicine. The prophet would bring a rain which would dampen and weaken the Americans' gunpowder, but would not affect that of the Indians. The warriors would be immune from American gunfire, and if they attacked during the approaching night, before daylight, they would be invisible to darkness. But the master of life had informed him that Harrison must be killed. If the general died, the long knives would, in the prophet's own words, scatter like young quail. But if he lived, the Americans could not be defeated. If the warriors attacked before dawn, the prophet's medicine would protect them. During the night, between 600 and 700 warriors surrounded Harrison's camp. And a handful even penetrated the perimeter, got inside the camp, hoping to kill Harrison prior to the general assault on the American position. But as the opening paragraphs of this paper related, the large war party surrounding the encampment was discovered by a century, and the battle started before the warriors were ready. Inside the camp, most of the Indian infiltrators were discovered and shot, while two warriors, specifically searching for Harrison, mistakenly shot and killed Colonel Abraham Owens, who, like Harrison, had been mounted on a light-colored horse. Owen had a white horse, Harrison had a very light gray. To Harrison's good fortune, his own mount, a light gray mare, broke loose from her, from her tethers at the first sign of gunfire. The general who sprung, to his, uh, sprung up and threw his clothes on could only find a dark horse that belonged to his aide-de-camp. So he rode off on that one. The confusion over horses may have saved Harrison's life, but it did not bode well for the Indians. On the perimeter of the camp, the initial Indian volley had caused the Americans to retreat back toward the camp's interior, but they rallied and made several sorties toward the Indian lines. In turn, the tribesmen repulsed the sorties and continued to pour musket fire in on the American position. Harrison wisely ordered all campfires within the camp extinguished, and the battle was fought in darkness. The fighting seemed to rage or intensify at different points along the American perimeter at different times, with both sides making small gains and retreating back to their former position. Finally, however, as dawn broke over the Tippecanoe, the warriors began to retreat. Harrison ordered several forays to push them back more quickly, and they melted into the underbrush. The prophet's medicine had failed, at least 50 of his followers were dead, and another 70 to 80 had been wounded. The Americans suffered 188 casualties, of which 62 were fatal. Tenskwatawa took no part in the fighting. While the battle raged, he remained on a small rise near Prophetstown, safely out of range, praying to the Master of Life and spewing incantations. But as the warriors retreated back to Prophetstown, many confronted him and accused him of being a charlatan. Particularly incensed were the Winnebagos, who had lost many kinsmen in the battle. Seizing the holy man, several Winnebago warriors threatened to kill him, and the, only the prophets pleased that unknowingly he had allowed his medicine bundle, his, his powerful uh, source of things through which he communicated with the great spirit, he had, he had allowed his medicine bundle to be touched and polluted by his wife. 
who, according to unknown to him again, had begun her, had begun her month, menstrual period. Since menstrual blood was universally seen as an even pollutant, the Winnebagos pushed him away in disgust and allowed him to leave. Yet his power as a, as a holy man was broken. Now in the hours that followed, the Indians abandoned Prophetstown. Most fled up the Tippecanoe into northern Indiana or scattered across the prairies into Illinois. And when Harrison sent a party into the village on November the 8th, the day after the battle, he found it to be deserted. Only one old woman, too infirm to travel, remained in the town. The Indians carried away some of their stored arms and, and supplies, but much had to be abandoned. The Americans confiscated arms, ammunition, furs, Indian garments, and other possessions, and gathered up foodstuffs. Before they marched to, back to Vincennes, however, they burned over 5,000 bushels of corn and beans. They also set fire to almost all of the wigwams. Tecumseh's southern trip had not gone much better. He first journeyed among the Chickasaws, but the tribe had a long-standing animosity to the northern Indians, and George Colbert, a leading mixed lineage leader among the Chickasaw, did much to neutralize Tecumseh's efforts. Among the Choctaws, Tecumseh was opposed by a cadre of pro-American chiefs led by Pushmataha, David Folsom, and Peter Pitchlin. Again, he garnered few recruits. He scored better among the Creeks. Tecumseh and the prophet's mother had been Creek, and among the upper Creeks, his message received a more favorable reception. Here he was helped by several Creek holy men, and the Creeks eventually rose against the Americans. But tragically, however, this uprising eventually ignited a civil war within the Creek nation. It decimated the Creeks, but voted well for the Long Knives. Now, Tecumseh arrived back in the Tippecanoe, January 1812, to find his movement in shambles. The prophet and a few followers were camped on Wildcat Creek just east of Prophetstown. And when Tecumseh arrived at their camp, he seized his brother, shook him, and threatened to kill him if he ever again jeopardized the Indian movement. Tecumseh spent the rest of the winter trying to rebuild his following. He also tried to placate Harrison, even agreeing to journey to Washington during the following summer. Meanwhile, riders were sent again to villages in Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, telling the Indians that all was not lost, but to remain in peace until further notice. And with the exception of Mainpock, most complied. In mid-May, Tecumseh even attended a multi-tribal conference sponsored by the Americans, where he was denounced by other Indians, and in which he said, well, if he'd have been at Tippecanoe, things wouldn't have happened that way. Following the conference, however, Tecumseh journeyed to Canada, where he sought new supplies of ammunition and, and food, which were sent back to the Tippecanoe, and Tippecanoe was partially rebuilt. The prophet remained there. Ostensibly, at least, the Indian coalition, while smaller, was, had been rebuilt and was perhaps ready to strike the Americans. But the movement itself had changed. The Battle of Tippecanoe, while hardly a resounding American victory, losses were similar on both sides, actually the Americans lost more, was a significant, not American victory, but a significant Indian defeat. The movement had been partially re rebuilt, but its religious core, the spiritual heartbeat that had formed its basis and had seemed to assure the warriors of divine intervention, was gone. The prophet's medicine had proven false. The master of life had turned his face from his people. Tecumseh was a skilled orator, and his plans for a united front against the long knives made sense, but he no longer had divine sanction. Like Little Turtle, Blue Jacket, and other tribal leaders who had tried to unite the tribes with British support against the Americans in the 1790s, Tecumseh also could offer political savvy, savvy and military experience, but the struggle no longer was a holy war. And in retrospect, I think that most tribal people realized that without divine intervention, the struggle was doomed to failure. By 1812, the demographics of the old Northwest had shifted, shifted markedly in the Americans' favor. During the American Revolution, 
The Native Americans had outnumbered whites in the region. And even in the early 1790s, the two sides were so similar in number that the Americans had no great advantage. But by 1812, American settlement was spilling into Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, and tribal people themselves now were a shrinking minority. Moreover, in any military struggle, they were critically dependent on the British for logistical support. Assistance that even Tecumseh admitted was at best inconsistent. Without the Master of Life's particular blessing, their fate was sealed. And if Tecumseh, and if the Tippecanoe ter marked a turning point for Tecumseh, it was even more so for the prophet. After the Battle of Tippecanoe, Tecumseh's excuse me, after the Battle of Tippecanoe, the prophet's influence plummeted. Although he still chanted his incantations, few people cared or even listened to them. During the summer and fall of 1812, he remained at a partially rebuilt prophet's town, then retreated to Canada in January 1813. Now totally eclipsed by Tecumseh, the prophet lived in his brother's camp until October the 5th, 1813, when Tecumseh was killed at the Battle of the Thames. Following Tecumseh's death, the prophet remained in Canada for the rest of the war, and he continued to live in exile and embittered ward of the British government until 1825. He then returned to the United States where, ironically, he worked to promote Indian removal. He died in relative obscurity in Kansas in November 1836. In contrast, Harrison emerged from the victory, from the, quote, victory at the Battle of Tippecanoe as a national hero. And coupled with his leadership of American military forces in the Northwest, he continued to pursue a political career, which culminated in 1840 when, as he was known, Old Tippecanoe, as he was fondly known, became the first Whig candidate ever elected to the presidency of the United States. Yet maybe Tenskwatawa eventually got the last laugh. Harrison was also the first president to set another precedent. On March 4, 1841, the newly elected Harrison, a 68-year-old president, gave his lengthy hour-and-a-half inaugural address, standing bareheaded in a freezing rain in Washington. He caught a cold, which rapidly progressed to pneumonia, and on April 4th, just one month later, he died. The shortest term in office for any president in American history. So maybe the prophet's medicine, while sort of slow to come around, still had a little kick in it. Okay.